Then we'll come back to the main room. Then we'll come back to the main room for a panel discussion with our panelists today. Um, if you don't know who our panelists are, you can check out the event, right? Otherwise, you'll find out more about them later. Um, and during the panel discussion, feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat later on. So even later when you're in the breakout rooms and you suddenly have questions that you would like to ask um, some other experts on, feel free to like keep that in mind and ask the hard questions to our panelists later. Then we'll do a closing and we'll end tonight's event back in your breakout rooms. So why we're doing this is so that you can reconnect with the other breakout room um, leaders that you're meeting tonight um, and also have the opportunity to digest everything that's gone on tonight and think about what are your takeaways as well as like any applications you can have for your own community experience. Um, we'll end the event in the breakout rooms so that if you want to continue to chit chat with the other people in your breakout rooms, you can feel free to do so. Um, the event call itself will close at 9.30 p.m. But there's no obligation to stay beyond 9 p.m. if you don't want to or if you have something else to rush off to. Yeah, so that's what's going to happen for the next two hours. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I hope that you are seated somewhere comfortable with uh, a computer screen or a device that enables you to be able to get into conversation with other participants. Um, we also have an activity later we'll, where we will be using Google Sheets or Google Slides. So ideally, if you are on a computer, I think that would be more helpful for the breakout room so that you can type stuff into your own slide because you'll have um, some breakout room activities later. Yes. So um, I'm just going to begin by introducing the concept of the community journey. So firstly, before we get there, what does it mean to be part of a community, right? Because there's so many different ways to categorize community. Um, a community can be your hobby group or your interest group. Maybe like you have a running group or you have like a rock climbing group or you're someone who's really passionate about gardening and have all your like plant lover friends. Um, maybe a community could be a cause that you are passionate about uh, and you're championing. It could be an identity. So for example, it could be a religious identity, like maybe you identify with your church group or a specific denomination. Um, community can also be categorized in different scales. So for example, your block or your neighborhood or your region or your country. So it could be, for example, like block 52 in the Passeries neighborhood. You are like east side, best side. And then you identify with Singapore being like a community or a Singaporean identity. Um, there are so many different ways that you can categorize community. Um, and for tonight's session, we hope that you can anchor yourself into one specific community identity that you would like to think about how you can develop and strengthen. So for example, the organization that you're here representing tonight, you can think about um, a community that you may be volunteering in or leading. You may not even be a leader in any specific community, but think about a community that you care about and then use that as the anchoring identity to go through this evening's activities. If you can't think of anything, um, you can use your school or your workplace or previous experience in your life just to go through the exercises of tonight's um, discussion. Yeah, so what is the community? More or less, it's just a group of people with something in common. And we hope that through tonight's activity, you'll be able to come up with ways to improve your community's experience. Um, so what about communities, right? Communities generally have goals, or they have like purposes or something they wanna achieve. And there are different ways that you can categorize these objectives or these purposes. So they can be internal to the community. Maybe one of the goals that you have in your community is to strengthen relationships between members in your community. Maybe you want to see a mentorship happen between the more senior members and the more junior members in your community. Uh, maybe you want to see um, higher engagement or more retention, less attrition in your community. Maybe a goal that you may have for your community is external. Um, a certain impact that you want to make to the larger society beyond the people that you've brought together. It could be about the amount of trash that you hope to see your community pick up. It could be a, the amount of like, funds that you're hoping to raise for another group. So all communities have goals, um, and we hope that as you, even right now as you're hearing me talk about this, you can think about for yourself, you know, what are some of the goals and the purposes that your community exists to serve? Communities are also made up of people, you know, communities aren't just like, like what's in a community, who's in a community, right? So tonight we're talking about the experience of our community members, and every person is different. Like even all 93 of us on this call, are so different, right? We have different motivations, different backgrounds, different hobbies, different interests, different stories and life experiences. Um, but even for tonight, we're all here on this call for the next two hours together. So tonight you're on this journey with us as we figure out what is it to be a community and how do we improve our community journeys together? So I would say even this bunch of people in this call 
all of you are like community leaders, community developers who care about improving the experience of your community. Um, and I mentioned the word developer, like what is the developer? So a developer is really just someone who takes interest in shaping the experiences of the people in the community towards the goals and the vision of the community. So earlier, um, you may have received, if you signed up earlier, um, you may have received a message from one of our colleagues mm -hmm. talking about um, the different, the community journey journal, right? So this is a tool that has two portions. There's a developer version and a member's version. And for the developer's version, it's really an opportunity to kind of put on the, the lenses of like, what is the experience that I am shaping for the people in my community? Yeah, so tonight, um, thank you for being here. I hope that this evening session is useful and meaningful for you uh, to think about how you can improve the experience of your community members. Um, if there's anything we hope for you to take away, um, I hope that you yeah, just realize that you have the power to shape the experience um, that you are crafting for the people in your community. Um, so then now what is the community journey, right? The idea is that like everybody experiences an experience <laughs> through the community that they're, they're part of. And you can think of it like a journey. There's an entry, there's a middle bit, and then there's a exit bit. So what happens in entry? Um, typically, this is when the developers or leaders, such as yourself, will recruit members, um, identifying selection criteria, right? Maybe you have um, like an interview process to identify whether this person is suitable to join the community or not. Maybe there's certain like paywalls or criteria that, oh, you have to pay like $100 in order, in order to join this community. Um, and as a leader, you would select suitable members, or maybe you don't have any entry criteria, but all are welcome. That could be a community criteria too. Um, in this phase, typically, uh, as a leader, you may conduct onboarding activities to induct new members. From the perspective of a participant or a member, this is from their lens, typically the time when they find out about a community. It could be a referral, word of mouth, um, marketing, announcements. They would apply, they would get selected, and would be joining this community. So this is what the entry phase is. It's the start of the journey. And then after you start, then you experience, right? So in the next phase, which is the experience phase, this is typically when as a leader, you would encourage members participation and contribution. Like you want them ideally to be actively involved in the community, to be um, contributing their skills and talents and ideas uh, to, perhaps you would also plan training opportunities to develop people that you have identified as potential leaders who can step up to take the reins of the community in the future. Um, for members, from their point of view, at this point, they would likely join activities, participate, initiate, contribute, grow, and maybe take on new responsibilities uh, in the community and step up into leadership roles. So this is like the, the bulk of the experience in a community. Um, and lastly, all community journeys come to an end. So this is the, the final part is the end slash exit process where um, as a leader or well, typically as a member, they would express the decision to move on from the community. Um, in other situations, they may be even asked to leave. Um, and then they will have the final moments in the community where you have your farewells, your goodbyes, or they could just inactively fade off into oblivion. Um, as a leader at this point in time, you may want to gather feedback on their experiences so you can identify how you can improve the journey for future people. Um, you would either bid farewell or encourage members to return as alumni or maybe contribute back as mentors. Um, and as a leader, at this point, you would figure out how to better improve the experience for future members and plan for better uh, subsequent recruitment cycles. So this is the overall of a community journey. Hopefully, um, this is quite straightforward. It's really just the experience that people go through uh, through your community. So um, now what we're going to do, actually, is I will invite one of our speakers mm -hmm. to share a case study. Um, so Shireen uh, will be sharing with us uh, how she has crafted the community journey in her organization, the Tamils Representative Council Youth Wing. Um, and hopefully, as you hear her story mm -hmm. of um, the community journey that she's created, you would be able to map back some um, similarities or differences into your own community experience. Because after this sharing, we will be going into the breakout rooms where you will have the opportunity to map out your community journey. Yeah, so over to you, Shireen. Thank you, Grace, and hi, everyone. I'm Shireen, and I'm the current chairperson of the Tamils Representative Council Youth Wing, also known as TRC Youth Wing. So TRC Youth Wing um, is basically 
uh, we aim to be like the voice for the Tamil youth in Singapore and we also want to provide the platform for our youth to excel in various fields. So these fields would include like arts and culture, um, sports and wellness, sociopolitics, entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and generally our members member pool is made up of youths between the age of 18 to 30 and they are in different stages, in different life stages. So some of them are in school, some of them are working, some of them are in NS. So we have quite a varied um, profile of people who join us. And um, when we started, I would guess our typical involvement for a member to stay in the community will be around one to two years. So when we inaugurated in 2018 and up till 2020, um, we started to realize that um, a lot of our members started dropping out and we, we had some challenges that um, we started to face. Uh, next slide, Grace. Yeah, so the challenges we found out was that um, a lot of our members started to withdraw from our organization and this was due to a variety of reasons, namely being that their commitments and responsibilities changed over time and there was also a lack of interest in continuing their volunteer work with us. And uh, I guess one of the, the lesser known um, reasons was also because when uh, our members joined us in friend groups, once one, friend, one or two friends leave our organization, um, the whole group will also leave together with them. So we realized that there was a need um, for us to, to come up with um, like a, a community journey or just a way for us to, to see how we can better engage our members to help, uh, get them to be more active. And this was when we were introduced to the community journey journals, uh, both for the leaders and members. Yeah. So what we did was uh, we actually brought down the leaders um, of the organization, myself included, plus my EXCO members, and we brought down some members um, from our community and uh, we, we sat down together to, to do up the community journey journals and thereafter we got into a discussion to see how you know what are the things that we needed to improve on what were the expectations from the member side what was the expectations from the developer side and you know see, see just try to find ways to troubleshoot this and um, our main learning point um, next slide Yeah, so our main learning point was that we also realized that there was this importance of crafting a journey for our members uh, because this overall creates a better community experience for them. And it was also important for us to create opportunities for membership journeys within the organization. So um, I guess one of our biggest changes was that we decided to uh, come up with two tracks in, in terms of membership. The first being um, if someone were to join us, they can join us as a TRC Youth Wing committee member. So this would involve a lot higher commitment from them and they will be more involved in running our projects um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas the second track would, was something that we called a Friends of TRC Volunteer. So this is more of an ad hoc um, ad hoc commitment where they could come down uh, for an event and help out in terms of facilitating or mentoring or in terms of operations. So it's a lot more flexible to for people um, who had very tough schedules. Yeah, so the typical journey that we decide to craft um, from this uh, will be as follows. So firstly, um, we would start with our recruitment and this will come in the form of an info session for potential members. So we'll put out like a poster on our social media channels and then we'll have um, a number of people who are interested to join us and we'll invite them down for our info session and this info session basically um, iterates our organization's objectives as well as the expectations and commitment um, if they wish to join us as a full-fledged member or if they wish to join us as a volunteer. And this is also the point where members can choose which track that they want to be a part of and um, also for them to meet the leaders um, of the organization and ask questions um, which uh, maybe was something that they want to find out more about. And this gives our members a better understanding um, of the organization and it also helps us to better understand what are their needs and what are their objectives when they join. And moving on to the next stage, um, on the onboarding side, for TRC Youth Wing, we generally hold uh, meetings every month or every other month. So during this period, um, should we have like maybe five or more volunteers who join us, uh, we will kind of spotlight them and give them like the opportunity to share to the rest of the community um, about themselves, what they do, you know, and why did they join us. 
And during these meetings, we'll also have short activities or games uh, for just, just so for everyone to get to know each other. And uh, we also would set aside time for the different teams, like project teams, to convene and welcome the new members so that they don't feel like left out or lost um, if they were to join like in between um, a pro when a project is happening. Uh, during this period, we also use like um, utilize our project directors who will who will step in and welcome the new members and kind of just uh, bring them up to speed on what's happening in the organization. So when we move on to the uh, participation side of uh, the journey. This is when um, on the leader side, we will actually do individual or team check-ins um, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And this is just um, an opportunity for us to hear how our members are doing uh, so far and if there are any things that we need to address. So um, this ensures that our members feel heard by the leaders and the after action reviews that we do throughout also highlights the, their contributions and also um, helps us to improve on like our existing processes. So uh, for this, it was very important for us to, to meet our members one to one. And I think one prime example of this was something that we called the September check-in sessions that we did last year. So instead of holding a general meeting for that month, uh, we decided to meet uh, each member for a 15 to 20 minute session just to see how they were doing, um, you know, how did they find like the projects that we're doing? Is there like anything more that we could do for them? Um, and secondly, we also, it was also a point where we realized that we needed to start identifying members um, who showed like more potential or had more willingness to commit uh, more to us. So uh, we will actually add them to what we call committee teams. So the committee teams would focus on publicity or focus on welfare. So these are like little areas where our members can show interest and then they'll be engaged uh, further. And lastly, um, I think one important uh, aspect that we decided to keep uh, in their journey was the fact that they'll be able to switch between high commitment roles to lower commitment roles at any point of time. So what this means is that, for example, if someone was a full-fledged member with us, but suddenly they find themselves being unable to um, commit further or priorities has changed. So they can also at that point request to, to become a Friends of TRC volunteer and that's something we'll try to um, engage with them. And throughout this whole process, I think the, the, the number one question from the leader's side is that we'll constantly ask our members like as an EXCO, um, how can we better support you in your journey and what are the ways you know we need to improve on since this is all a learning process for us. Okay, next slide. And um, I think when we also looked at the journey for the members, um, one thing was very important was the idea of leadership succession. So we wanted to identify members who had leadership potential and give them like possible avenues to develop. So what this means is that we decided to create something called shadow roles within the EXCO. So if let's say um, I had a vice chairperson, uh, we would open an opportunity for someone from the members member pool to join in as a shadow vice chairperson. So they'll get to sit in for EXCO meetings, um, attend meetings with our external partners, you know, just to see how things are running at the more like administrative side. And we'll also op open opportunities for members who uh, who wish to develop their skills further. So they will attend workshops on facilitation, they could attend workshops on um, designing, video editing and things like that. And we will try to make that, make that space or create those opportunities for them. Yeah. And as we moved on and as the journey goes, you know, we realized that um, it would eventually come to an end. So this is uh, when a member were to um, express their the um, idea of leaving the organization. So that's when from the EXCO side, we would check in on their journey thus far and we'll also try to find out the reasons why they are leaving. Is it because you know, they, no long, they are no longer interested in the type of projects that we do? Or is it because you know, priorities have changed and then they are no longer able to commit as much? So this is also the point where we, um, we will kind of open the opportunity for the members to stay on as volunteers, as a friend of TRC volunteer, or if not as advisors, so that whatever knowledge um, or experience they have gathered from their previous projects, they are able to pass it down to new members. And 
yeah, I think this is just a rough like skeleton of how our journey looks like. And I'm going to hand this over back to Grace. Yeah. Thanks so much, Shireen, for such a comprehensive sharing as the overview of the TSC Youth Wing community journey. Uh, hopefully, I mean, in Shireen's very structured sharing, um, you've been able to get a glimpse of what it is to like chat or craft a community journey. Um, so what's going to happen now after hearing Shireen's example is that y'all are going to go into your breakout rooms to map out your own community journey. Um, so what we're going to do now for the next 40 minutes, I'll be on time. Oh yeah, oh my gosh, we're like pretty punctual. Okay, so we're going to go into the breakout rooms for the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, firstly, you'll get a chance to get to know other people in your rooms. Um, so uh, there are a ton of different people from very different backgrounds and sectors here tonight. We have students, we have people from like crypto, we have people from nonprofits, we have people from like consultants and HR backgrounds. Um, it's really a ton of different people. So I hope that today's uh, breakout room session would be interesting for you to meet someone um, either from a similar background profile or a very different community background as yourself. Uh, but hopefully, as we've shared so far, that the community journey largely has similar structure, right? There's a beginning portion, there's a middle portion, and there's an end portion. So as you go through the breakout room activity, um, do anchor yourself in one specific experience of a community that you would like to think about improving the journey of for tonight. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you'll have some time to reflect about your own community journey and then uh, discuss with one another. But I'll leave your breakout room facilitators, who are MEPC colleagues, to share with you more on your breakout rooms. So, yeah, I will. Uh, hello, Shaley. Hi, hi, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, there is a little bit of a conflicting uh, messaging here, which I've not intentionally corrected. Um, so I'm an HR professional for more than two years, and I'm also a certified executive coach. A uh, large part of my experience has been in the financial services industry, but the last five years were in the consulting space. I currently head HR for Asia Pacific for a company called TPI Cap, um, and I've been associated with NVPC for more than five years uh, as a you know uh, HR committee member. And I'm also on the board of Teacher Ekim Matra. So yeah, and I've just been associated with Community Journeys uh, for a very long time, done multiple conversations. So I think many of you I've met with in the past sessions. Thank you, Grace, over to you. Thanks, Shady. Um, Next we have Emily. Hi everyone. Yep, um, I'm actually in charge of uh, the Active Aging Center at Lions Befrienders. So um, before this uh, stint uh, at the Active Aging Center, I was doing volunteer management for more than 10 years, also at Lions Befrienders. So um, the thing about uh, what I have been doing together with uh, my organization is about uh, building bridges uh, between the organizations, uh, the seniors, and as well as the community, be it the individuals or, or a group of um, corporates and uh, other people. So thank you for coming here tonight, and uh, we hope to share more later. Thanks, Emily. Um, Emily is also um, an NCSS volunteer management champion. So thanks, Emily for what you do for volunteers. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we have Shireen who uh, shared about herself earlier. Anything else you want to add, Shireen? No, I think it's all good for me. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're going to do now for the next 30 minutes is a panel discussion. Um, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask the panelists first. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to open up for a time of Q&A. So if um, any of you, you know, after having the breakout room discussions and you're thinking about like, oh yeah, I haven't really thought about this part of my community experience and you want to learn more from our speakers today, uh, feel free to ask those questions in the chat and then um, I will ask them and I'll them up to our speakers tonight. Yeah, so without further ado, um, these are the three broad buckets of the Q&A for tonight. Um, the first two things I'll be asking our panelists are about the community journey and how they identify gaps and address them. And then after it's a move into a time of open Q&A. Yes. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to start. And the first question goes to Shaylee. And the question is, why should we care about community and community journeys? Yeah, it is very interesting. Actually, I wanted to go a step back a little bit. You know, why are community important? You know, why are so many of us on the screen, almost 90 plus of us on the screen, 
you know, come back every month, every bi-monthly to talk about communities. So historically, the Greek philosopher Aristotle had said that man is a social animal, you know. There is an in, um, intrinsic need in us uh, to be accepted, you know, uh, uh, you know, our presence to be felt and uh, we feel we need to uh, be comforted. And that is where our, it's our need to connect with each other. It's a basic instinct of a human being, of a living being to connect with each other. And that is where the community plays a very important role. And these community can be anything. Uh, you know, all of us living in Singapore is one community. All of us from uh, education institution is another community. Uh, all of us having interest in uh, sports, a particular sport is, is a community, right? So uh, that is where I think, uh, you know, our, our existence uh, becomes more relevant when we uh, form these communities. Now, why should we care about this community journey? Why we need to care about this community journey is because it is such an integral part of our life. It is our intrinsic need uh, to be part of these communities. So we want to treat our community members the way we want to be treated, right? And we want to build relationships and bonds uh, to survive together, to thrive together. And a great example for me uh, in this is a new community which got formed during COVID, right, was just being human beings. Uh, uh, the minute COVID hit, the only the, our survival instinct and our thriving instincts told us that we need to just go all out and help each other. So how many people were looking after the migrant workers who were put into isolation? They were collecting uh, you know, basic requirements for them because we knew that if they survived is when we survived, right? That is how strongly we interlinked. And I'm sharing this as an example because that is um, uh, the best example of the fact that uh, the community journey matters for sheer survival and for sheer thriving uh, in the world. And that is where I think, uh, you know, it is important for us to think about why we are investing so much of time in building these communities and focusing on building a harmonious community journey. Yeah. Thanks, Shivi. And maybe a, a follow-up question is like, how do you see HR relating to the concept of community and community journey specifically? Um, especially with respect to HR, when we talk about community, you know, um, just about exercise where there are different touch points in the life cycle, the person touches a community, you onboard a community, you know, you uh, kind of volunteer or you stay with the community to do, perform your role and then you exit, right? As where uh, how how you create delightful experiences at each of these touch points is probably where uh, that some of the HR knowledge um, brings a lot of relevance in the community environment too. Yeah, Grace? Yeah. Thanks, Shady. I think uh, Shady might have been a bit frozen for some of you at that point in time. Uh, what she was saying was just that um, in the same way that HR practitioners look at the entire experience, um, it's really about creating delightful touch points at every stage of the community journey. Yes. So the next question is for Emily. Um, I'd like to ask Emily, you know, what do volunteers mean to Lions Defenders? And how do you craft like a community journey that is meaningful for your volunteers? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. So basically volunteers are a valuable asset to uh, Lions Befrienders because they bring about a lot of uh, cultural diversity and uh, uh, towards the community that we are serving. So we are the elder care community. So um, despite um, like we have a common goal to serve the seniors, uh, individual, be it the student, corporates, um, they come in with different experience and uh, different knowledge and skills. They brought about um, different um, experience to the seniors. Like the corporate, actually some of them came in with uh, um, like uh, in the digital aspect, they taught the seniors about how to use uh, the handphone, how to log into the Zoom. And this actually helped them uh, to interact during the COVID period. And the students, 
continue this journey by continuing to connect with the seniors through their regular VIA over the Zoom. And uh, they were patiently listening to the seniors about the, uh, their life stories and so on. So these volunteers actually having them from the different background, uh, it helps to enrich the life of uh, the beneficiaries. And I think you also asked about uh, how do we craft the journey for them, right? Um, we have uh, four main uh, VM philosophy, the framework. Uh, so the first framework, the first part of the framework is really about the, the philosophy. That is the entry portion where we need to align in terms of the purpose and the goal. Um, because it's important that uh, we have certain alignment in terms of why do you want to serve the seniors and what is the outcome you want to achieve. So then we can manage the expectation. Then the second portion is uh, about um, uh, a volunteer driven goals. So we need to empower the volunteers after we have al alignment in terms of uh, the purpose. So we need to empower them to let them think about what they can do based on their skills and experience. Then the staff will actually curate what are the things uh, in terms of the proposal, um, to look into the proposal, which are the points that was well done and which are the points that uh, can be further improved. And uh, what are the expectation uh, or how can they anticipate uh, what, the, what the reactions of the seniors be like? Because uh, maybe the proposal seems to be very well done uh, and the students could be thinking that the seniors will like it a lot. But then we, the staff will need to curate and say, okay, this is suitable for more for the younger old. But the crowd that is coming is the older old adults. So you might need to tweak a bit more. So that is uh, in terms of the volunteer driven, they plan and power, but with curation. Then the third phase is about the learning. Okay, so uh, there will be training and learning um, to skill them up in terms of the, the um, like uh, along the way, um, what are the things that they need to improve on and uh, also about um, other health talks or other uh, social connections or communication skills that are required to bridge more connection. And finally, is of course the appreciation um, to make sure that uh, moments that they know that they have done well and what are the things that they can further improve in. Yeah, this is how we map out the community journey for uh, our volunteers. Awesome, thanks Emily. I was just taking some notes in the chat while you were at it. Um, if there's anything I type wrong, feel free to just like edit it. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks, Shireen. Um, how has you know charting the community journey shaped your community? Yeah, I think for us, um, it really helped us shape our volunteer experience because I remember that when I joined my organization uh, back in 2019, there was not much structure to it. And uh, I realized I was being thrown into like very different, different places. And then for after a while, you know, everything just became a blur. So when we started crafting the community journey, um, or at least when I became a leader and I started crafting the community journey for incoming members, um, we were able to like understand like their different needs at every stage and it also helped us better understand like um, what each uh, member was feeling or going through when they joined us or when they're in the community or when they're exiting. So um, this was also important uh, because we were able to identify uh, certain stages where members tend to be more or uh, more disengaged and then that was when you know we could intervene as leaders and, and come up with ways to like better engage them or make, make sure that you know they, they, they stay active uh, throughout their journey with us. Yeah. Right. I feel like I'm a live transcription. <laughs> um, Shirley, how do you identify gaps in the community journey? So um, I'm sorry to say that all my examples are going to be from the corporate world, but you know uh, I feel they're highly transferable. So typically, how, how do we figure it out that there are gaps in the employee life cycle, if I were to use, which is parallel to the volunteer or the community member uh, experience, if we were to draw parallel from. Um, one, uh, we do employee satisfaction service, uh, you know, to kind of 
check where their gaps, where their happiness. Um, so there are now, I think with the technology, uh, you know, these surveys can be far more frequent or far more uh, instantaneous. Uh, you don't have to kind of launch one big employee satisfaction survey at the end of the year, which used to be in age old times uh, in, uh, you know, when I started my career with the corporate world. Uh, now it has become so instantaneously that the person has just finished the interview uh, and has received an offer from the company and pop five questions come on the screen. Uh, you know, how was your interview experience? You know, um, uh, and the person has to just put a smiley, like a sad face. Or, or, or a glad face that I'm full of gratitude or I'm unhappy or I'm happy, that's it, done. You know how the experience was. So some of these instantaneous organizational listening tools now are available, which are giving you an instant feedback, which you can cumulatively co collect. And you don't have to pay uh, attention to every detail in my mind because you will tire yourself. But what we do is we pick up the themes. Uh, if the themes are that people are very unhappy uh, with the way, uh, you know, our policies are defined, they are not very user friendly. Uh, if out of 100 people, 80 people are saying this and I've scored the least on it, then that is something which I want to work on, you know, because that is where consistently I'm getting a message that there's something gravely wrong in terms of my benefits, which nobody is using it. So once we have these, uh, organizational listening tools. Then we have these uh, data which comes in uh, um, just in time. Uh, then we kind of pick out themes out of it. And that is how we work on uh, the improvement methodology uh, on the gaps that we have. So and another thing I can add here is uh, while that is a quantitative way of uh, picking up the gaps, there is also a qualitative way of picking up the gaps. So once you, through surveys, you've got to know where the gaps are. You can do qualitative interviewing with your uh, focus groups, uh, smaller groups, to get more color around what, where exactly the issue is and what exactly the issue is, so that your solution is very tailored made and is very impactful. So usually uh, we always complement the surveys through qualitative feedback process, through focus group discussions. Yeah, Grace? Thanks, Shady. Um, Emily, any thoughts then? I mean, how do you identify gaps in the volunteer mm. experience? Yeah, um, quite similarly, uh, but then because of the group of uh, volunteers that we have are two groups. Uh, the home base, we usually do once uh, a year kind of a survey through um, Google Forms and so on. Then at the end of the survey, we actually submit a report to share with the volunteers about what are the, the gaps and so on and how we can further improve. But um, the center-based volunteers, uh, we get to see them more regularly. That's where we do more of the informal kind of uh, like a chit chat session um, to find out where are the things that we can actually improve on or what, what are the things that uh, like a situation where they can be can do better yeah then uh focus group discussion is not so much at the centers more at the as an informal kind of settings because the group of volunteers are different but for corporates and students it's usually after event debrief uh, we would spend a short timing to like uh, find out how did they feel about the events and so on yeah that's where we do, uh, in terms of the feedback, different kind and different modality. Awesome, thank you. So I hear, I mean, from Shady and Emily, it's really that there's different uh, ways that you can gather feedback informally and formally. I mean, through the different touch points that you have with your community. Um, I think even structuring something more regular, like as an annual review also helps for planning for the next year. Uh, what about you, Shireen? I mean, like, I think, you talked earlier in your own community journey about identifying gaps, right? So how have you been able to identify like opportunities for your, I mean, how have you been able to address some of the gaps that you've identified for your community? 
So I think one of the gaps that uh, we identify is that um, sometimes there can be a mis mismatch of skill sets. So um, we realize that because most of our members are youths and um, they not they have not had prior opportunities to develop certain skill sets. So we we realized that there was this importance of developing it with them. And one thing we try to do as an organization is that we are always looking out for opportunities for our members to uh, undergo workshops, trainings. Um, anything along those lines uh, where they have this opportunity to develop their skill set. So uh, I think one prime example would be um, we conduct uh, work, uh, this, this sort of workshop called um, iFolks. So this is mainly like teaching elderly, like temp Indian elderly, how to use um, smartphones um, and apps, you know, on your phone. So this is conducted in English and Tamil. And uh, one thing we realized when we were getting youth volunteers to help uh, facilitate these workshops is that they don't really know how to engage uh, with the beneficiaries. And that's when, you know, we, we bring in our external partners and then we try to uh, create like a facilitation workshop for them where they can learn some skills and then uh, they'll be able to utilize it, you know, during the workshop itself. So um, it, this kind of things kind of gives them that confidence to, to develop their skills. And for people who have like more experience um, in, in doing a particular thing, um, they are also there to, you know, guide the newer members um, so that they are able to like develop further. And I think um, a lot of the responses that we got from, from having uh, workshops like this has been very positive because um, they don't usually get these opportunities outside. And then uh, with us providing um, you know, a platform of opportunity for them to develop, this is something they can also like, take uh, away uh, outside of our, our organization itself. Yeah, I love what you said about being able to like, cross transfer skill sets that we pick up in different dimensions of our lives. I, I mean, I think I can say that safely for all of us here, right? Like from the different uh, sectors or opportunities or even workplaces and volunteering areas that we've had, there's definitely different tips that we've uh, seen or, or skills that we've picked up from different experiences that we can transfer into other parts of our lives. Um, so thanks so much to our panelists for addressing these two big questions. Uh, I'm also just gonna open up the floor now for Q&A. So um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them to our speakers in the chat. There's one question that I noted earlier on that was asked. Um, I think it was from Kathleen. And the question is about disengaged members within a community. So the question is open to the three of you. Whoever has something to share, just feel free to unmute yourself. Um, the question is like, do you have any tips on how do we jumpstart engagement and have people energized again? So this is about disengaged members. So I just resurface the question below. <laughs> I think I can, I can go back to some of the corporate experiences. This is what we get paid for as HR professionals, you know, to develop uh, in a community of engaged employees in the organization that you're working in. Um, I think there is no silver bullet, uh, no single silver bullet that you can fire to engage your volunteers. Uh, usually many a times, you know, you need to get to the bottom of the issue. Uh, you need to peel the onion and get to the bottom of what are the underlying reasons for the disengagement. Many a times we just study the superficial reasons, you know, like very often the corporate word I hear, oh, like, why are people leaving our organization? And, you know, they are so disengaged. Uh, and the simple answer, the manager would come and say, ah, salary is less, you know, there are better opportunities outside. We are not paying good salaries, you know, but when you unpeel the onion, why did this person even receive the call from the, uh, from the placement consultant uh, and why they hadn't done it all this while? Why did, it, they, did, did they, they do this time? Probably there was some trigger, some unhappiness with the new manager or the leadership or something or the work that they're doing that they cannot connect and align their purpose with. A uh, great example for me is if money was the only reason uh, which keeps people engaged, then I can guarantee you what would have solved the problem. You know, just pay more and you, were solved, you would solve the problem. It is more often than not is the non-alignment with the purpose or the culture of the place, which is extremely toxic that kind of makes, disengages the, uh, the community member. So um, focus on that, uh, get to the bottom of the issue. Uh, don't accept superficial responses or superficial 
logic for why people are ed- disengaged it's like putting a bandaid you know if you really want to heal the wound you need to kind of really heal the wound from the bottom so that it does not resurface again you don't just put a bandaid on the wound so that is the only um advice i can give for engaging with the uh, creating an engaged community volunteers is a great example right they don't get paid anything they are so passionate about for the purpose that they are willing to give their time for free they are not concerned whether you're paying them or not paying them so um, i always wish that i had a battalion of volunteers in the corporate world uh, that will build such a engaged workforce for us you know and i always draw examples from the volunteers because there's an alignment of purpose there so yeah thank you and anything to add to it yeah um actually for me i have a more like practical um thing that we did in our organization so um i think when we start to realize that a member is being like disengaged or start to become inactive because um maybe a project director will take note that um this member has not been responding to messages or they have not been turning up for meetings so they will kind of raise it up to like uh, um to the exco and that's when we step in and then we'll drop them a message like hey um you know we've noticed that um you have you know not been attending you know is there any way that we can help or is there anything that's bothering you so this kind of like one to one um check in or chats with them will help us to like what she did said um get to like the bottom of um of of the issue and um that's when we also realize or we find out the reason why they have been inactive so someone um may share that you know suddenly um they have a lot of other commitments outside of our organization and they are no longer able to be very active in developing projects for us so that's when we try to find like solutions together and then we say like okay i mean i understand that you know you are still keen to volunteer with us but you just don't have enough time um to do so so that's when you know that's when we open the opportunity for them to come in or as an advisor or come in on an ad hoc basis so they are still in the community but they don't need to um be as active in the community um or another reason is uh they could give is that they are no longer um uh, interested or they're no longer passionate about the project that they are doing so that's when um you know for us we want to provide that platform for them to care, to do what they love right so we'll try to again brainstorm ways where okay let's find out what you are passionate about then and then let's see what we can craft out for you so it's it's a lot of this like one to one um check-ins and talks and also building that relationship with them that will help us understand how we can engage them uh better in the future as well um for us we actually have a uh, experience a uh, group of uh, quite a huge group of this engage uh, volunteers especially during the covid time um just now sharing like during covid time most of our volunteers cannot do any physical uh, volunteering and um they had to switch to telephone calls and so on so during that period uh quite a number decided to just um not do anything um so we assumed that um it was really because um too much things to handle and so on but uh because each group of volunteers we do have a staff in charge like a vol- volunteer exec to take care of them so they would try to check in with them um on the volunteer leader uh through the volunteer leaders we will see what are the issues so at times we get feedback that uh generally family commitment time management and uh, we do have a lot about even the volunteers mental health are being affected so that's where we actually um look into um setting up a uh, skills training and uh, talks wellness talks mental health talks or simple yoga sessions um to create this mindfulness and relax um kind of environment to uh, blast out to all the volunteers including the disengaged volunteers that is not all about work and volunteer but we also can look after your well-being so this helps to um to soothe the kind of uh, stress that they had during that period yeah so some of them felt appreciated that uh, okay at least um someone reach out to me not just asking me to do work and uh, commit to some things but uh, um engage me in a different level to take care of my well-being Yeah. Thanks Emily. I think that kind of also address some of the caring for the well-being of community members. So, 
I've just summarized, um, there's a ton of questions that just came in. I've just summarized them in the chat into the five sessions. I'm also conscious of time. So um, maybe what I'll do is I'll invite the speakers to just respond. You can pick a specific question that you would like to respond to, or if there's a thought that kind of addresses some of them uh, altogether, just invite you to respond to whatever you would like to respond to. And then if there's anything else, you can always just type a response in the chat. And to everyone else, I mean, who's listening in, if you too have an answer to any of these five questions, just feel free to like type your answer in the chat as well. I mean, uh, you're listening in, but I'm sure all of you have a wealth of knowledge and experiences that you can also draw upon that'll be able to benefit um, uh, the questions that have been asked here. So um, I'll like ask Shady and then Shireen and then Emily to respond. But in the meantime, if you have answers, just type them in the chat and you know can respond to the conversation as well. Shady, over to you. So I was keen to answer the introverted question. Is engagement important for introverted members who might prefer to be left alone to do their things? If so, how do we engage them without making them uncomfortable? Um, it's the biggest myth. Engagement, the signs of engagement is not somebody who is uh, smiling, partying with you, going out, um, you know, uh, dancing. Uh, that's not the only expression to show that I'm an engaged volunteer or I'm an engaged community member. Uh, that's the biggest myth uh, in my mind. Uh, engagement is all about that uh, I'm very passionate about what I am doing in the community and I show up or I live up to my promise for what I have committed. If I have said that I'm going to come on Monday, Wednesday, Thursdays, and these are the five things I'm going to deliver, I'm going to passionately work on them, deliver. I could sit in a corner of the room and deliver it or from home. You may not even see my face, but you know I'm so passionate that or I'm so engaged with the community work that I've delivered it. So um, extrovertedness is not a measure of engagement. It's a biggest myth, you know. So just remember that uh, people who are hanging around to drink with you late evening, singing songs with you, dancing. Uh, some of my most committed team members are the one who like to go home on time uh, because they have family responsibilities but I can bank on them because they'll show up and they'll deliver the work that I need. I don't have to follow up with them. And they are some of the silent speakers right at the back somewhere. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to kind of talk about in terms of how to safeguard the communities we serve. How do you draw a boundary between something a volunteer is doing under the umbrella of the organization? You know, uh, I'm sorry if I've got this question right. Um, sorry, Grace, can you read this for me? Uh, in terms of safeguarding the communities we serve, how do you draw a boundary between something a volunteer is doing under the umbrella of the organization versus the volunteer continuing to engage on a personal basis? Yeah, so um, this is the hardest to achieve in my mind uh, because uh, if you have 100 members, community members working with you to do a very sharp job matching of what your interests are and what your alignment of purposes are with what we are assigning is sometimes very tedious in the organization, right? But however, at to the best of your knowledge, I think Shireen also brought it up that if you do this job matching, which is what is your competence and what is your interest what is, versus what is the role that we have uh, that the community needs for, for, uh, for you to perform, if we can match that, that the engagement is stronger, you know, but I must admit it is not possible with 100% of the members to do it. But if we can continuously keep focusing on it, uh, you know, in the first opportunity that you can correct it, then you should correct it. At least allow a person to voice it that, listen, you have put me into this back office job, but I love doing fundraising. So at least I know what you're interested in. The minute the fundraising opportunity comes in, or if there is a project that I can carve it out for you, I'm ha happy to give that to you along with your additional work that you're currently doing, you know, and slowly help you transition to the other role that is more in line with your competence and your expectation. I'm so, sorry, sorry. Could I, th thanks for that. Could I, this was my question. Could I yeah. uh, clarify what I meant? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually, I was wondering about when you have a vol when you have volunteers and they meet with like a vulnerable population, um, and then the vulnerable 
and then they kind of uh, are no longer doing things under your organization, then they continue just as on a personal basis because they've established a relationship. How do you make sure that um, the, the, the receiver of their volunteerism um, is aware that there's this transition that like we as an organization can no longer vouch for whatever this volunteer is doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I understood. I understood. Mm -hmm. um, would there be a concern and upfront kind of talking about it to the person who's a beneficiary that, you know, uh, this person is no more a part of the organization. Um, however, feel free because you have your personal relationship um, so, so that you're able to upfront kind of uh, make a claim that the organization is not responsible for the outcome of um, the services that you're getting from this person. This is completely based on, uh, if, I, I, if I'm there with you, uh, I, I would just say that let's, this person is not part of the organization anymore and your relationship is purely on the personal capacity. Uh, is, would there be a concern if we were to declare that? I, I don't know, I'm just asking. Maybe I mean, um, I'd like to invite Emily to add in, uh, yeah. since this sounds a bit more similar to the specific context that Bernice is asking about. Okay, sure. Um, so for question number three, so what happens is that uh, there are such things. So um, as a start, we need to uh, set the context very clear between the beneficiaries and uh, as well as the, the individuals who's volunteering. So if you know as a start is a short term, you would need to inform um, the beneficiaries that uh, this, this uh, volunteer will be coming from when to when. Thereafter, the volunteer should not be visiting you on a personal basis with without um, informing the staff in charge. So set this context clear right at the start, at the beginning of the whole journey, then uh, at, to both the parties. But uh, at the end, when um, the journey completes, you need to remind again, because sometimes uh, beneficiaries as well as volunteers may forget because they might have built a certain rapport. Yeah. Um, and they think that uh, it's all right, uh, I will just come in as a personal capacity. So when that happens, um, sometimes we need to set, sadly, but as an organization, we really need to set a disclaimer that um, um, after this journey of uh, like uh, during this period, the volunteers should not be communicating with you directly. This is to safeguard your safety and well-being. But should the volunteers come in um, to visit you, I think at the capacity as a start, it's better to just across the gate, example, across the gate, there is still a safety net. But mm -hmm. if you were to let the, the volunteer in, um, then they will need to take the accountability, but always be safe. Yeah. Um, that's how we actually um, share with the volunteers because you can't monitor every individual honestly all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Shady. That's yeah, really thanks helpful. both. I think that was very practical. Um, another question for Shireen, which is question five. Yeah, so um, actually, if it is that very reason why um, my organization, we started the Friends of TRC volunteer group because we realized that there are people who want to commit just a few hours of their day um, to do something meaningful, but then they don't want to engage um, with us any further. They don't want to be part of meetings. They don't want to come down for bonding days. They don't want any of that. They just want to give their time to volunteer and then they want to um, do other things. So this, uh, for, for, it, for, for, for that particular reason, right, we started an ad hoc basis where they come down just to do that. And that is enough for them to be engaged because during those like volunteer sessions, we are already able to find out, you know, why they are here with us, what do they, uh, what is their need, what is their objective, and then we just play um, along accordingly. So this is already very respectful of their boundaries. And um, I think it's also important for us to understand that there is no need to over engage people if they don't want to be engaged so um, it is also perfectly okay to just bring them in uh, to just do the work and then that is enough uh, for them to continue like their journey thanks Shireen. um emily is there any other question you would like to address 
Oh, I just typed in the group chat one of the question uh, regarding burnout. I think um, regarding burnout, I think it's really true for everyone. When it's time for a break, we have to give them the break. Um, this is a way of uh, respecting um, the volunteers that uh, we hear them. Um, should you need a break, if you want to step down totally, uh, let them have the break, but then uh, do uh, assure them that uh, while you're having the break, I will just check in regularly on you to show the care and concern. So um, this regular check-in is still important such that uh, you give them the time and space for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, you are there reminding that uh, I'm your friend supporting you. Feel free to come back whenever necessary. If you need further help, um, I mean, I can link you to services, resources at times like this. Yeah, because some volunteers, um, they may not share why the reason of this burnout. It could be because of the journey that they are volunteering, but it could also be personal issues. Yeah. Just adding to what Emily said on a burnout, uh, we typically also try to manage it through policies. Uh, and there are some kind of long-term uh, break policies, um, you know, after five years of working, after 10 years of working, a person can be on break for a week or two weeks or a month, something like that. So these are like forced processes by which a person is asked to go on a break. Uh, to recognize that you have been consistently working for very long uh, number of years you put in a service. So we do get, kind of give them structured breakthrough policy. You know, so that's another way you can look at it. Thanks, Shaley. Um, this comes to the end of our panel discussion. So just thank you so much to all our panelists for sharing your perspectives uh, with all of our audience tonight. Um, if you would like to leave some encouragement, you just feel free to like say thanks in the chat or shout out in the chat. Um, if you would also like to connect with any of the panelists uh, beyond this session, I uh, will also be sending their, I guess, their LinkedIn or some form of contact uh, in the chat. Yeah, so you can feel free to connect with some of our panelists there. Yes. Uh, oh, we've already done this group photo. Um, oh yeah, okay, so some final things. Uh, upcoming... Um, we're actually going to be launching a, crafted, a community a podcast about community leadership soon. So this will be launched um, at the start of August. So feel free to uh, feel free. Do check it out once it's launched. Um, we'll actually be covering various topics related to the community journey. So tonight's session is really um, an introduction to the concept of a community journey. Uh, giving a quick overview of the different stages of a community journey. This podcast will cover different phases of the community journey. So we have some episodes about onboarding community members, some episodes about leadership succession within communities, some episodes about um, how do you navigate when a community member decides to move on. And we actually have uh, stories from leaders across different sectors and backgrounds. So we have people from companies sharing about staff moving on. We have stories from um, leaders of nonprofit organizations talking about how they onboard volunteers. Uh, we have stories from um, executives of nonprofit organizations talking about how they raise leaders in their nonprofit organizations, or even stories from ground up groups, um, how they raise new leaders to carry on these ground up volunteer groups. So yes, this podcast will be launching next month, so do look out for it. But we'll also be sending you an email because haha, we have all your email addresses now. Um, so yeah, that will be launching next month. Please listen to it and tell your friends and other community leaders. Um, another announcement is that for the rest of the year, if you really enjoyed tonight's session and you want to learn more and deep dive further, we have a bunch more of community leadership series topics coming up. So actually in August, our next session will be looking at improving volunteer engagement. Um, so this is specifically not about staff, but it's really about volunteering groups. Um, how do you improve uh, in an unpaid volunteering context community? How do you improve the experience for volunteers? Um, then the rest of the year in the different months, we'll be looking at different topics of community life. So we'll be diving into this topic about trust, like what is trust in community? What destroys trust? How do you restore trust and um, strengthen relationships in communities? We'll also have a topic about principles for community leadership and community building. Um, one topic about mental well-being, because as leaders, um, as much as it's important to care for our members, we also have to care for ourselves while caring for the people that we care about. 
um, and we're also going to look into the topic of asset-based community development. So these are some of the topics. These are not the finalized topics, but do keep a lookout for our upcoming events. But I guess we'll also send you an email uh, when the time comes for that, or you can just yeah follow us and, and keep um, at City of Good SG. So yeah, that's uh, MVPC's Instagram handle and website for you. Um, Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, lastly, resources page, if you go to the Community Matters website, which was also sent to you, um, or will also be pasted in this chat. Yeah, you can also check out other resources about community development, community leadership. We have a ton of articles um, from previous interviews with other community leaders that you can read through to get inspiration on how you can improve your community experience. Um, if you have an awesome community story that you think everyone should know of, or for example, if you're in a breakout room and you heard someone share and you're like, wow, this is so inspiring, please do let us know also so that we can, I guess, profile them and, and share these resources with more people. Last thing, feedback form. Um, as, as earlier was shared, right, like, uh, is feedback is very important so that we know um, how to do these kinds of sessions better. Uh, and if we did a good job, please let us know that we did a good job so that we can feel better about ourselves. <laughs> uh, so now I'd like to invite you to take uh, a minute or two to fill in this feedback form. Um, so we'll give you like two minutes or so uh, until the numbers look decent enough um, to fill in this feedback form. And then once you all have filled in this feedback form, we will send you back into your breakout rooms to close the conversation with your new friends and other community leaders that you have met tonight. Yes, so I hope you enjoy um, the breakout room closing time afterwards. But we can't send you there until you do the feedback form, haha. <laughs> so please do this feedback form now. <laughs> Thank you. The link has been sent in the chat. If you don't know what's, what's going on, um, yes, please fill in this feedback form. Thank you very much. And yeah, hope to see you at subsequent sessions of community leadership series. Woohoo!